Good afternoon. Greetings from us once again. Today we want to present a very special video and we are looking at chemistry KCSE 2021 paper 1. We want to look at the importance of form 1 and 2 syllabus to a candidate. Most of our students do ignore this work that was covered earlier in the days of high school. Most of the time you find they dwell so much on the form 3 and form 4 syllabus at the expense of form 1 and 2 work. Remember in chemistry we have always said that paper 1 and 2 they cover the whole syllabus. There are no special topics for, for, for paper 1 and again there are no special topics for paper 2. So today we want to look deeply into paper 1 and see how important form 1 and 2 syllabus is. This will be revealed by the percentage marks that the paper contained that uh, was brought from Form 1 and 2 syllabus. So before we begin to look at these questions, let's start with some statistical analysis here. So we are saying that uh, questions from Form 1, we had a total of 12 marks. If you do 12 marks out of total possible 80 marks, you get 15% of paper 1 having come from Form 1. This is a big percentage, students, that can never be ignored. Moving on to, paper, to Form 2. Form 2, we had a total of 18 marks in Paper 1 that represents 22.5% of the total marks in Paper 1. Again, this is a percentage too big to be ignored. Now when we combine the two classes, we get a total of 30 marks out of possible 80 marks. So from 1 and 2 for the year 2021, Chemistry Paper 1, we had a whooping 37.5% of the total marks coming from from 1 and 2. So from this statistical analysis, you all agree with me that that A that you finally score at Form 4 needs to be worked on right from Form 1. With that, let us go into the, the questions and see how best they were supposed to have been answered. So we start with Form 1 work. This is chemistry 2021 paper 1. We start with form 1 work and the first question that touched on form 1 work was question number 2 and it read part A state the condition under which a Bunsen burner produces a luminous flame. The answer expected here was when the air hole is closed for one whole mark. Those who have better understanding of Form 1 work, you realize this is something that came from introduction to chemistry. The first few days of your school in secondary level, you were taken through the apparatus, and one of them that you had a comprehensive study was the Bunsen burner. So you can see that a question actually came from there. Part B is not necessarily Form 1, but because it was part of Question 2, uh, I decided just to put, in, to put it in there uh, because we could not afford to exclude it from our discussion. So write an equation for the reaction that took place in a luminous flame 
assuming the laboratory gas is butane. So this one is borrowed from organic chemistry of form 3, equation writing of form 2, and the Bunsen flame of form 1. So here, uh, butane is an alkane. Alkanes normally have a general formula of CN H2N plus 2. Being butane, it has four carbons. And then the hydrogen should be 10. 4 times 2 is 8 plus 2 is 10. This is a gas. When you burn it in oxygen, it is uh, mixing with oxygen. And you are able to get soot because this is a luminous flame. Soot is a form of carbon. And then you get carbon 2 oxide because the combustion of the laboratory gas is not complete. So you will get the lower oxide of carbon. That would be the equation. And at form 2, we learn the idea or the act of balancing. So a 5 on water, a 3 on carbon 2 oxide, and a 4 on oxygen would balance. I have explained that this one is not form 1, but it was part of question 2. So it demands that we just do it. Now, to part C. One of the regions in the luminous, in the non-luminous flame is the unburnt gas region. Describe how the presence of this region can be shown using a wooden splint. So again, this is testing on the Bunsen burner and the procedure of determining presence of the region of unburnt gas is that you slip a wooden splint across across the middle part of the flame this would be for a half a mark and then after you you've done that the central part the central part remains unburnt remains unburnt or uncharred while the outer part burns so this is the experiment you could do to actually show the presence of the unburnt gas region from one work being tested at from two now we proceed the next question that came from form one is number four and this is from the topic water and hydrogen so you are told a small piece of sodium metal was placed in a beaker containing pure water state two observations made during the reaction there are quite a number but you are asked just to state two for one mark so i will give you all the possible observations but you are supposed to state only uh, two so the first possible ob observation is the piece of sodium the piece of sodium metal it darts or we could use the word floats this is a possible half a mark the next observation would be the metal melts into a silvery ball this is another observation that could give you half a mark and then we also have production of effervescence production of effervescence or hissing sound this again if you wrote you get half a mark and then finally the beaker becomes warm simply because the reaction produces heat and this kind of reactions that produce heat remember we call them exothermic reactions at that level so any two would give you the one mark moving on to part b of number four state and explain another observation made 
when a drop of phenolphthalein is added to the mixture in the beaker. So we know that the resulting solution is actually alkaline due to formation of sodium hydroxide. So the solution turns pink. We all know the indicator phenolphthalein turns pink in alkaline uh, conditions. So solution turns pink because of formation of sodium hydroxide. So half a mark for turning pink, half a mark for formation of sodium hydroxide. Another student would write that an alkaline solution is formed. You did not have to tell us the exact name. If you wrote alkaline solution is formed, you still get the next half a mark. Now, the last question, explain why it's not advisable to carry out this experiment using potassium metal. So, this is quite easy. Potassium reacts explosively with water. So the word would be explosively, but the examiner even accepted more vigorously instead of explosively, or you could even write more violently. All those would give you the one mark. Now we proceed to the next question, and this is still from one work. This came from air and combustion as well. We are talking about rusting. So in number six, we were asked, the following apparatus and chemicals are used to investigate the percentage of air used when iron rusts. So we have iron filings. We have 100 ml measuring cylinder. We have a trough and we have water. So question 6A for two marks is asking us to draw the setup. I will use my free hand because in chemistry, as long as your diagrams are workable, we do not need to look at how good they are drawn as long as they are workable. So allow me to use my free hand and I wish I had drawn this early, maybe using a ruler, but for now, allow me to draw using freehand. So that is our inverted measuring cylinder. Of course, we make it wet so that uh, at the bottom here we have iron filings sticking there after you have made it wet. And then this is your water, this is your trough, and this is your measuring cylinder. Of course, it should be graduated so that you're able to take readings. It should be graduated like this. So that is the simple setup that we would have for the setup. Now, it is two marks, so we would award as follows. A half for labeling water, a half for labeling iron filings, a half for labeling measuring cylinder. Then the next half mark came from what we call workability of your diagram. This would give you the last half mark to total two marks. So what do we mean by workability? Workability means is your diagram able to give you the expected results. So for example, if you didn't calibrate if you didn't calibrate if you didn't calibrate your measuring cylinder you'd lose the mark on workability again if your measuring cylinder is slanting you will still not get the half mark for workability because if you slant your measuring cylinder obviously you will not be able to get accurate readings okay yes now the next question asked asked us to write an expression write an expression to show 
write an expression to show how the percentage of air used is calculated at the end of the experiment. So moving up to our diagram, the expected results after two days, after your ion filings would have rusted, the observations are quite a number, but the most important one is that water is going to rise inside the measuring cylinder by about a fifth. So, if you have your original length of the air column, here it is, we can use letter X to represent it, height of the original air column, represented by X in our diagram, and then after two days, when water will have risen inside the measuring cylinder, we can have the height of the new air column represented by Y. So with these two, we can then be able to write an expression, and the expression would be original height of air column represented by X minus the final height of air column represented by Y divided by the original height of the air column and this one you multiply by 100%. I know there are candidates who would get this other height, the height of the water after it has risen. So let's say we use Z to represent it. A candidate who did this would have the expression that uh, the percentage is shown by Z over X multiplied by 100%. All these are possible solutions to your question for one mark. Now, moving on, from one still had question number 18. And this one came from separation of mixtures. This is the method called solvent extraction. So describe how propanone can be used to extract a pure sample of sunflower oil. Now, crush for a half a mark the sunflower seeds using a mortar and a pestle. After that, we are going to add propanon. Remember, the question has specified the solvent. After adding propanon, you star. Adding propanon, half a mark. After this, we are supposed to decant for half a mark. And finally, we expose the extract to sunlight for propanon to evaporate, uh, leaving the oil behind. So evaporate the last half mark. Question part B did not come from uh, form one, but it was part of question 18. So we are going to solve it as well. State why sodium hydroxide is not suitable for extraction of sunflower oil. So this is an information that we shall understand in Form 4 when we shall be talking about organic chemistry too. So what happens is uh, sodium hydroxide will react. It will react with oil and we are supposed to form soap. So will react for the one mark. So more about this will come up in form four. To that end, we are through with the 12 marks that came from form one syllabus. So I now welcome you to form two. And remember here we had said a total of 18 marks came from the form. Remember, this is just paper one. If we combined paper one and two, or even practicals, you realize the knowledge in form two 
is very handy for somebody who wants to perform well in chemistry subject. So number one was the first question from form two and part A we are told draw a label diagram showing the atomic structure of magnesium. So here we needed to have known that magnesium being atomic number 12 has 12 protons and then when you subtract uh, atomic number from mass number you get the number of neutrons which come to be 12. This should be the composition of your nucleus. Then moving on to the first shell there will be two electrons. These ones can be put in the region or on the line. We don't penalize if you put them on the line as well but it's ideal to put them in the region because these are called energy levels. So it's a region and then you put the last shell with only two electrons. This would be magnesium. So for 12 protons half a mark, 12 neutrons are half a mark and putting the 12 electrons for one whole mark. I repeat that these electrons can also be put on the line. If you put them on the line, maybe you are taught that way, we are not going to deny you marks. I moving on, part B, the atomic number of phosphorus is 15, so the configuration is 285, which means it needs three electrons to be stable. For that matter, it has valency three. Chlorine, 287, it needs one electron to be stable, so valency is one. So for every atom of phosphorus, we shall need three atoms of chlorine. And because all of them are nonmetals, a student was supposed to think of covalent bond. So phosphorus in there, the first chloride atom is here, and we are pairing or we are sharing a pair of electrons there. Chlorine having shared one in the common region, the other six will remain unbonded. That is the first chlorine. The next chlorine, the same story. The same story. And the third chloride atom, the same story. Please, we have to see clearly the difference between atoms of chlorine and atoms of phosphorus. So it had five on the outer shell, phosphorus. It has used three to bond, which means those two will be unbonded. Okay? So that would be the answer. A student would go also for what we call the Lewis structures. So you could uh, give us the Lewis structures, which don't show the lines. You only put the atoms and the electrons this way you still score the mark so those two were possible answers from structure and bonding of form two next is question number three the elements sodium this is on effects of electric current on substances. We also do more about conductivity in the periodic table when we talk about uh, period three and even the groups when we talk about trends in electrical conductivity you might meet this kind of information. So in number three we are told Sodium, magnesium, and aluminium belong to group 1, 2, and 3, respectively. Select the element with the highest electrical conductivity and give a reason. So the answer is aluminium. Selecting it is a half a mark. And you continue to say that it has three delocalized electrons. While sodium and magnesium has one 
and 2 respectively. So here, remember we said the more the localized electrons a metal has, the better the electrical conductivity. So that is all you expected to write for number 3 to get the full one mark. Still on form 2, number 5, describe how a pure sample of copper 2 nitrate crystals can be prepared using recycled copper wire for 3 marks. Heat for half a mark, the copper wire in air to form copper 2 oxide. So this question we had looked at elsewhere and we said copper is a metal that doesn't react, it's not very reactive. For that matter, putting it in dilute nitrate, nitric 5 acid directly would not give you the salt. So we convert it into the oxide first and that's what we are doing in step 1. So after that, we are supposed to add excess copper 2 nitrate to dilute nitric 5 acid. Add excess another half a mark. After this we are supposed to filter. We are filtering to remove excess or unreacted copper 2 oxide. Filtering the next half a mark. Once we filter we heat the filtrate actually heat the filtrate to saturation heating to saturation the next half a mark and then once it has become saturated we allow the hot saturated solution to cool cooling here the next half a mark to form crystals now because we were asked to get pure crystals we are supposed to dry the crystals. This one we do maybe between filter papers for the last half mark. Total three. Doing well? That was question five that came from form to work. Next question was number seven. The figure one, this graph shows a graph of atomic radius of some group 1 and 2 elements. So we can see it here. Yes, we have atomic numbers, sorry, atomic radius in micrometers and atomic number. So this is lithium, sodium, beryllium, magnesium. Now, moving on to the questions and I want to answer the last one before we move to the first ones. We are asked to predict the atomic radius of calcium. So here we are. We are supposed to use the graph to predict the atomic uh, radius of calcium. We know the atomic number of calcium is 20. So we are supposed to use this to predict its atomic radius. So what a student was supposed to do is to use a ruler to extend these group 2 graphs until we reach 20. So take a ruler and extend this line here until you reach atomic number 20. There we are. Atomic number 20, calcium is here. Okay? So if you read, we are getting around 2 Zero 08 when you read the y axis where calcium is. So, the answer to the question of predicting atomic radius of calcium would be 208 micrometers. The examiner was lenient enough to give you a margin of error of 2. So anybody who gets to 20, to, uh, 210, and also somebody who gets 206 would still get the answer. Now coming to 
the very first questions. Explain why atomic radius of sodium is higher than that of lithium. So if you look at their configurations, sodium is 281 and lithium is 21. So obviously radius of sodium is higher than that of lithium. But what is the reason? The reason is very easy. Sodium has three energy levels while lithium has two. And you can see that from their configurations. Ah, yeah. In the next question we are being asked, explain why the atomic radius of sodium is higher than that of magnesium. So here, sodium is 281, magnesium is 282. This is period three, and we said the more protons an element in period three has, the smaller its atomic radius because of stronger nuclear attraction. So the answer here would be the effective nuclear charge is higher in magnesium than in sodium. You could also say that magnesium has a higher number of protons. This comes out very clearly when you read about the trends across period three. Very, very well explained. Now to number nine, which was still from two, and this is a question that came from carbon and some of its compounds. So the one compound of sodium that we learn at POM2 is carbon 2 oxide. So here we burnt it in air. A student should know we are producing carbon 4 oxide at the point of burning, which then we put into calcium hydroxide solution. So what do we expect to see here? White precipitate. And the teacher went ahead to say that if you bubble carbon oxide into this solution for long, then the white precipitate would dissolve. Reasons were explained in form two. So let's have a look at the questions that came. The first question is, state the precaution that should be taken in carrying out the experiment. Experiment should be done in a fume chamber or in the open. Eh? This would give you the first half a mark. The reason being carbon to oxide is poisonous. For the next half a mark, I Question part B, state the observations made in the boiling tube. So here, the examiner assumed that the experiment went on for quite a long time. So for that matter, the fight precipitate would be formed, but it would finally dissolve to form a colorless solution. Now, White precipitate one mark, dissolves another one mark. So here, the advice to students is, when you bubble carbon-4 oxide to calcium uh, hydroxide solution, for a short time, you form calcium carbonate. And that is what forms the white precipitate. But when you continue for a longer period of time, the carbonate is able to form calcium hydrogen carbonate, which now is a soluble salt. So your white precipitate is bound to dissolve. Good enough. Uh, number 23, still from two. And this one <laughs> was funny. We never expect such kind of questions in 
any exam. So state what is meant by a realm of an element, relative atomic mass. The mass of one atom of an element compared to the mass of one over twelfth of carbon twelve atom. Remember, this is the definition your teacher gave you? Yes, it can be tested. So don't ignore anything that teachers tell you. Now, part B was also a bit funny. A compound of carbon and element X with the formula CX4. So the ratio we get there is 1 is to 4. Contains 3.6% carbon by mass. Calculate the RAM of X. So we don't know RAM of X, so uh, we are going to let relative atomic mass of X, let's say it's a letter like N, and then we do the usual uh, tab tabular form for calculation of RAM. So we have carbon and uh, X there. The RAM, carbon is 12, X we do not know, so we let it be N. Let's go to percentage mass. Carbon we've been told 3.6. So if you do 3.6 from 100, you'd get 96.4 for X. That gives you the first half mark. Let's move to number of moles. As much as this is from 2, there's an element of uh, from 3 here, the mole. So to get number of moles, we divide mass by RAM. For this side, we can only do 96.4 over N. Then mole ratio. Mole ratio. Here we are getting 0 0.3. So mole ratio, we are supposed to do 0 0.3 by 0 0.3. We assume this is the smallest because you can see here 1 is to 4. And then this side again we do divide by 0 0.3. And we are supposed to get 1 is to 4, okay, from the formula. So to get N, we are going to solve this side. And we are going to say that 96.4 over N divided by 0 0.3 is supposed to give me what? 4. Where do I get 4? The formula has been given here as CX4. So the ratio is 1 is to 4. Now let's work out N. 96.4 over N divided would mean multiplying by the reciprocal. And I get 4. When you multiply, you get a numerator, 96.4, denominator 0.3n is equal to 4. Cross multiplication gives 96.4 is equal to 1.2n. And n alone is 96.4 over 1.2. And my answer is 8.3. RAM doesn't have units. So you give that as an answer without any unit. So half a mark for that, getting the right ratio, half a mark, and doing that division, half a mark. Totaling two, two marks. This is from two, but uh, this tabular format is normally used in form three when we are calculating molecular and empirical formulae. Don't forget, the understanding is from form 2, relative atomic mass. Good enough. Moving on to the next question that came from form 2. This is carbon and some of its compounds again. We've looked at the other number and this was number 9. Again, we are meeting the same, same topic in number 24, the same paper. So carbon-2 oxide can be prepared by dehydration of ethan dioic acid. Complete the equation to show the reaction that takes place. So the examiner is lenient enough to give you the formula for ethan dioic acid. So if you remember, we get carbon-2 oxide, we get carbon-4 oxide and water it balances out without much efforts. Now, 
state symbols were not a must here because this is organic. This is an equation involving organic uh, compounds. So you could as well ignore the states. Lastly, name another reagent that can be used to prepare carbon two oxide by dehydration. Students who went through that topic know very well we can use methanoic acid and we can also use sodium methanoid. Thank you. We've come to the end of our special video and the piece of information that we were interested in today is to tell our candidates not to ignore from one work, don't ignore from two work. We continue to wish you the best and we thank you for being our fan.